welcome, welcome to uh, this another beautiful day. And uh, we are honored to have one of the greatest women alive. <laughs> That's too much. Uh, today is amazing. Today is amazing, I'll tell you for sure. Uh, so today we have a guest who has done it all. She has uh, scooped all the awards that are there to be scooped. She has impacted the world of her girl child. Uh, and she's continuing to do amazing stuff. Uh, I can't wait to hear it, it, all of it with you guys. Uh, so welcome today. Uh, this is Michael Kimari. You can call me MK for Impact Masters Media. And uh, I would like to welcome Leila Ose Gandhi. <laughs> Thank, you. Name Thank you for special. name checking. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, how are you, Leila? I'm good. Thank yeah. you for having me. This is really cool. I'm so honored. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking I'm forward sure. to this conversation. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's interesting, like uh, we're having this conversation because um, uh, this impact media is just highlighting the impact in the tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk about tech ecosystem without mentioning the culture because mm -hmm. it has been a push for some a couple of decades right now mm -hmm. uh, across the world to get culture on the tech either building at the center of it because uh, they keep saying that if half of the team is playing, you're getting half of the winners. Absolutely. And it's quite interesting to know that uh, what you've been doing for a long time actually contributes a lot to ensure that the girls can get the same space, get the same resources, uh, get the same knowledge. And uh, one more aspect of this is that we can't start talking about all that and all the numbers without knowing who is there. Like, <laughs> beside what we know, what is out there, what is published, yeah. tell us who is there. Where is the Leila start from? Ah, that's a very good question. I, 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 I mean, I'm from, I'm, I'm, my family's from Somalia, yeah. um, but I had a very interesting childhood. Mm -hmm. So I grew up between Italy and Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. all the places in the world, because a, a quick history about Somalia, the south of Somalia where I'm from, it's an Italian colony. Yeah. And the language, the Somali language wasn't written until yeah. the 70s. Yeah. And so my parents yeah. had to study in other languages. My dad studied in Italian, my mother studied in Arabic. Yeah. So it meant a lot of, you know, there were not many jobs. My dad was actually a civil engineer yes. and left for Saudi Arabia just before I was born. Mm -hmm. And I think 10 days after I was born, I was in Saudi Arabia, so, mm -hmm. and he was working for an Italian company. Mm -hmm. So Italy was my second home as a child. So I used to go to Italy quite a lot. Italy yeah. was part of my upbringing. Yeah. Um, and then I actually went to school. I went to private school in Italy. This is before the war, you know, the war happened in Somalia. I think now people know Somalia is a war-torn country yeah. full of extremist groups. Yeah. The Somalia I knew wasn't like that. It was a very mixed cosmopolitan part of the world. Yes. Some of the most beautiful coasts you'll ever see, mm -hmm. not being biased. <laughs> no, it's it's it's, it's, it's really it's, it's really one of the most beautiful. Uh, and, and I and I and I lived in Mogadishu, which is on the coast, yes, right? Yes. And so that was really my my early. Uh, and I had very interesting parents. My mum uh, was an economist, worked for the government. Mm -hmm. My dad, uh, obviously an engineer, did re and then became a big entrepreneur yeah. in Somalia and and travelled a lot for work. So actually my parents made a big decision early on, which is very uncommon for Somalis, mm -hmm. which is just to have two children. I don't know if, if anyone is listening to this, Somalis we have minimum yes. seven children. That's, yes. If you have four, you just Africa, can't... You, Africa, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you have four, it's like you tried. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, you really you do not have kids. So, yeah. so my, that was quite radical for my parents to mm -hmm. make a decision. Mm -hmm. Because my dad was traveling quite a lot and they wanted to travel yeah. together. Mm -hmm. And I had two parents who, which is not quite, it's quite rare to see in our African community, two people are really in love with each other. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky to see two parents mm -hmm. who are deeply in love with each other yes. and respect each other. Yes. So I saw that quite early on. So that really influenced who I'm going to become, yes. I guess. Oh, you know? Amazing, amazing. So for me, that was quite my early my childhood was very that, mm -hmm. and then something really terrible happened though, somewhere along the line where uh, Somalis we have a practice called female genital mutilation FGM, FGM which happened to me at the age of seven. Yes. So so you can imagine you're in this love bubble, protective bubble, and then boom, something like this happens to you, and then 
everybody pretending it didn't happen, we just carry on, mm. and then this becomes a big issue mm. somewhere along the line. So that's really my early, and, and, and that experience has really very much influenced yes, yes, yes. everything Ooh, I do now. <laughs> but here you are, you've mm. uh, been born 10 days mm. in South Arabia, Italy. Mm. How was your childhood? Like, how, how, how was that? Were you traveling a lot? I traveled a lot. I was very privileged. Yeah. I lived a very privileged life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the big houses, mm -hmm. the drivers, the yes. best schools. Yes. Um, holidays, like every summer we went to Europe. Um, that was my child in Africa. I didn't even know Africa was poor until I went to the UK. Like, like I'm like, oh, I didn't so know. What? I saw so it on TV. I was like, oh, I didn't know. I, didn't, I mean, I, I tell this uh, story where my parents yeah. took us to India mm. to teach us about poverty. Mm. And, and I lived in Somalia. So mm. imagine, they take us there. And my mom would say to me when I, you know, when you know you leave your plate still full, yes. she will remind us, do you remember those kids who didn't have food in Bombay? It was called Bombay back then, not uh. Mumbai. Like it's, uh, so we, we had a, me and my sister, mm. we had a very uh, privileged life mm. where we... So you know, you're two girls. It was two, well, we have a, bro a brother came afterwards, but he was oh. born during the war. Oh. So he had a whole different experience of life. <laughs> was compared he to born me. also in Somalia? Or? He, was born, you know, he was born in Ethiopia. Okay. During, like, when people were moving around, like, literally, my mom falls pregnant in the most interesting. Yeah. <laughs> we joke that she forgot to take her pill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we we have this joke in the family, like, wow, it's good. Even during when people were trying to flee wars, mm. you two still had time to yeah. really hang, hang. Yeah. You know, I made a baby. <laughs> I made a baby. Hey, listen, they were, they were, my parents were very open yeah. about yeah. The, the, the love and attraction they had for each other. So it was. Um, so my brother has a whole different experience to mm -hmm. me and my sister. So he's heard all these stories. I mean, he managed to go back to Mali, but that was my that was my childhood. Like, yeah. I I had access. I, I was a girl who had access. Yes. And 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 then obviously, and I was lucky enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we were privileged enough to not even witness the war. So you know, a country knows when something's about to go down. Yes. So my parents had such access. The news was about to go down. So it was like me, my mother, so my sister. So they were privy to the information. We, it, it's like people had this inside information. Something was about to go down. There was something. My, I mean, my parents would tell me later on. You know, they sensed the energy shifting with mm. people. So it was like. So my 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 father said, actually, three we go back. Go back to you know. You need to leave the country. I'm not sure if you're, you're privy to like what started the war, but maybe in a nutshell, like what caused. Okay. To be honest, the fact that I didn't know there was such poverty in my country is what caused. Because the, the, the gap between the, hub, the privileged the and the poor was so distant that I couldn't even see it. That's what caused. That's what caused. And, and, and tribal issues. Yeah. Because there was one yeah. group of people that was benefiting from everything yes. and not the rest. And, and that causes a lot of anger and frustration. Yes. And I think... Uh, I, mean, I can't People go to the enough is enough. Enough is enough. Yeah. And, and and it's been brewing for many, many years by then. Yeah. yeah. And that's that I mean, in a nutshell, that's what really Well, I don't want to jump the government. Do you think with the you now the stabilization mm. the government are things coming to normal normalcy or they're creating other jobs? I mean I mean my family goes back every mm. my mom goes back every year. She absolutely, I mean, there's there a massive change happening in Somalia. Mm. Actually, Somalis have proved positive change. Positive change. Somalis, Somalis, especially in the South, have proved you can actually function without a government. We functioned <laughs> without a <laughs> government oh, for over 20 years. We, we, ever, ever, like, we, we had some of the best businesses. We had millions going yeah. into the country, millions going out of the country. Yeah. We were telling the world, you can function without a government. But yeah. obviously, then they had yeah. to have a government yeah. to be part of the world again. Yeah. So. In a way, it's like they hacked the, the whole system. Mm. So people, I mean, there's a lot of diasporas now going back rebuilding. I mean, yes. if you really get a chance, look at pictures in the show right now. It's so absolutely it's beautiful. It's, it's thriving. There's, uh, you know, people are rebuilding their homes again. But I also feel there's a sense of uh, it could be political, but there's this, and, and now we have oil. Yes. So yes. I, that worries me a little bit. Yes, yes. When when a country like that has <laughs> an oil means, yeah, we, yeah. We, we worry because you know there are other people who might want that resources. Ah. So. Okay. So okay, 
I that's all I would say. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. I, I, I have to <laughs> And one thing that I've noticed about Somalis, because mm -hmm. where I was born, actually, I interacted most of the Kusha, if not the Somalis, mm. but the Kusha tribe, mm. they're quite entrepreneurial. Oh, yeah. And open minded. Somalis, so, Somalis yeah. are shocked to yeah. today that yeah. people go to school for business. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they love Somali. Like, the cultures, they love it today. No, being a business owner mm -hmm. in a small community, mm -hmm. it's like part of who you are. Like, we don't go to school, so mm -hmm. they are shocked. When people are going to university, yeah, and sure. they're like, why? That's, a, that's so easy. Why would you go to a... So there's a natural entrepreneurism. Mm. Um, just now, literally before I... Uh, early on, I was on a call with one of my nieces who lives here. Mm. She was like, oh, you know, we just opened a shop mm. in uh, Kilimani Mall that does all the Somali garments. Because yes. I needed some for my sister's wedding. Yes. I'm like, this is, this is Somali for you. They literally, for them, opening a business is not... Big. As they call it to these startup companies. Mm. You know, we've been we've been startups for yes. a very long time. Yes. But except we just didn't think we had to go to school for it. Yes. Uh, so natural being natural entrepreneur like entrepreneurs, it really runs it's part of the culture yes. in Somali community. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that side of, uh, of, of of Somali is, is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and for you when I was checking out like who is a doctor? <laughs> we'll see. I was like, you are not that one, I say in terms of, you know, years. But what you have achieved is amazing. Like, you are a doctor, you are the most, um, the recognition from the, from the, from the uh, British Empire. <laughs> yes, right? the word empire sounds so, ter yes. so terrible. <laughs> oh yes. my gosh. Yes. And I'm like, <laughs> How, how was your school life until you get a PhD in your doctor? So let me clarify so, my PhD. Yeah. It's an honorary PhD. Oh, it's a, there's a great story behind that PhD mm. actually. Mm. So I trained as a psychotherapist. Mm. Um, so the same university I went to. Mm. But what I did as soon as I left, I set it up the first first ever mm. counseling service for yes. FGM survivors. Yes. Globally. Specific. Literally no one has ever set up that kind that of thing. That is at the level. So I just I, I was I designed it while I was still in university but I launched it after I left university. Okay. No one has done it, like it was the first one ever. Like I couldn't even go to anyone to find out who's done it, but they talked about mental health, but no one has done it before. Yes. So I launched it's called the Dahlia Project and what I recognized very quickly when I was trained as a therapist, yes. the therapeutic world was only designed for Westerners, not for oh. women like my mother. Women that look like you know our mums. It wasn't it wasn't designed. Yes. It was very westernized. So what I started doing, I started changing a lot of the values of principles yes. of therapeutic spaces. Yes. And I'll give you an example. Um, we had a, a group of Eritrean women mm -hmm. who, who, were, who were in a support group. Mm -hmm. And during an assessment, I would ask, what do you need mm -hmm. in order to feel this is your space? Yes. And they wanted mm -hmm. a, a tea ceremony with popcorn, because that's what Eritrean is drink. Yeah. Well, so they're, they're sitting in therapy, there's a therapist in the room, but they're drinking tea, spicy tea, popcorn, because that's what Eritreans and Ethiopians and Somalis like to drink when they're connecting. Um, so we introduced that and we realized a lot of the women who was coming to the clinic were illiterate, they couldn't read. So they were not going to therapy because they couldn't. They couldn't read the names of the address. They didn't know how to get there. So, so they can't get it. They, so what we did, I, so I presented a couple of documentaries. Every film, film when you're making a film or producing as you're producing, there's always a runner. They mm -hmm. call the runners, right? They go mm -hmm. and get the script, get the coffee, get the lunch for everybody. So I created a runner for my counseling service. So we would offer the women, when we, when we, we invited for an appointment, we have an option mm -hmm. for someone to pick you up. Because they know the local supermarket, yes. but they don't know the name of the street. Yes. So someone will pick them up from the supermarket. Mm -hmm. So that, I was criticized yes. by the Western therapeutic mm. world. It was like she's breaking boundaries, yeah. she is not practicing not practicing what she was taught to me. So I was being forced yes. to put uh, to have the to have the therapeutic approach, the Western therapeutic approach mm. on African women or which, Asian which, which, was, which was which was not working. I'm like, wait a minute, we're gonna have to create it. so I was criticized to the point where they wanted to take my license away. Yeah. They want to take my license away. It was really it was I but I insisted I'm like no and I said this is 
the way it should be. Yes. This is how if if Somali women want to eat meat during yes. their therapy, we're going to get them. They're, they're going to they're going to do that. We're going to have to do it their way. We're going to because they were saying I was having too much of an interaction with, and I, I said no, no. As Africans, when we are dealing with conflict, we sit under yes. a tree in a circle, we bring yes. food. Yes. So I started. So, but then what happened? The clinic became oversubscribed. Uh, and then the media picked up on it. Everybody saw so all these black and Asian therapists came and supported me and saying, this is what we need to be doing. Mm. And then the film came, the documentary came out. We were nominated for a BAFTA. All of a sudden, they couldn't criticize me anymore. Yes. So the same people mm -hmm. are the ones who gave me my doctorate for my great <laughs> clinic. <laughs> so crazy. So they now wanted to own me again as the university said, oh, she's one it. of us. We trained her. Uh, so it's a very, it was a very important award to receive because I, I was being criticized yes, yes. for creating a therapeutic space for African women. Yes. So that's how, that, that's what led me to my honorary doctorate. It, it actually <laughs> happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason why I started this uh, uh, podcast vlog, whatever, mm. is this to record our story, mm. tell the way it is, without any influence, mm. and, and, and tell the way it is. Because there are so many young guys, there are so many guys even our age who are confused. Mm. Should we tell the way it is? Should we conform to the Western way? Yeah. But we are one billion people. Exactly. Maybe ninety percent of those are the most killed people we have found in the world. The most crazy. And it's showing in different ways yeah. at the moment. So maybe, maybe if you don't mind, you can share your experience. Um, now that you say the privilege, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I can only. I'm, I'm privileged in certain spaces. <laughs> if I, if I, yeah. if, if my guess is right, mm -hmm. you could go to any school that you wanted. Not in the UK. Not in the UK. No. See, that was so. So uh, well, we, so we went from being very privileged. Mm to now becoming refugees. So we now live in the most deprived, rat-infested, cockroaches, buildings. I remember saying to my mom, what did we do? Like, did we do something wrong? Like, I swear to God, so imagine. And so, so, so parents, and this is very common with refugee children, your parents don't tell you it was about to go down. It was like, we're just going. Mm. And my parents never went to the UK. My mom hated the UK. Mm. She hated the weather. She hated the food. Mm. We, I don't think we've ever been, I think we've had a connection flight through London. Never yes. we stopped in London. Yes. All of a sudden, we're going to the UK because the UK and Australia, I think, were taking refugees at the time. Yes, yes. So my mom, my dad wanted to go to Australia Canada because... Was not taking they were, but they were taking people from refugee camps. Uh, refugee camps. So there was the privileged families who can get on a plane and actually go to the UK. And it was $20,000. Per person, so you only pay that. It's a fee. It's a fee you pay to get on the plane. Like that's why people. So people, the refugees who ended up in London and the UK, Europeans are the privileged Somalis because they could afford to get on. They could pay mm. their own flight and leave. Yes. But where others have ended up, from what I hear, like a lot of refugee camps here in Kenya. Yes. So America and Canada took refugees from these camps. Ah. Hence, we did to UN yeah. camps, right? So yeah. we we thought me and my sister thought we were on another holiday. Yes. <laughs> we're going to the UK, yes. and then slowly, slowly, we're like we moved to this like very rundown part of East London. Oh my God! When I say rundown, there was like drug dealers. There. I mean, it was like you can you watch the um, uh, American American movies. You know, like, where Jay Z grew up. That's yeah. that's the equivalent I went to uh, in London. All of a sudden, I had to walk to school for the first time because before I had a driver. Yes. Now we are walking to school. Mm. I'm queuing up for my food because the schools we my sister went to was private Italian schools where food was brought to the table, to us like a restaurant. Can you imagine the shock? <laughs> no one told you. Were it was. Are you stressed? Shocking. Are you depressed? I was. We were. We were. Um, no, it was shocking. It was very. I think because I'm the oldest and my dad was on it, I quickly took on the role of the other parent. I had to be supportive for my mother, so I I became an adult from the age of twelve. Mm. I was no longer a child. Twelve, I was an adult. Now. The leadership skills. Right. Exactly. <laughs> do you see? Do you see how I'm going to be shaped yes. very quickly? Because my dad wasn't there, so I became my mother's confidant. Mm. Like I was running, I was running everything. I would go to the housing office with my mother. Like there was, there was, a, and, and me, and my mom, till now, we have this very interesting bond from yes. that very traumatic experience. Yes. So nobody was crying or being upset, but we can see something new yes. that happened. Mm -hmm. You know where. I see my mother cooking and cleaning for the first time. Really, before she didn't, she didn't do that. 
So it was someone a, to do that. In Somalia, we had someone to do that. We had a whole staff in the house. We had three people working in the house. So my mom was cooking and cleaning. Uh, we walk into school, and, and my mom was now saying, it won't last for too long, mm. we'll go, this is just temporary, mm. like, we're going to go back. Mm. That was 1992. Yeah. Wow. How many hundred years? Well, it really bad. It, it, that was really bad, yeah. Because we, we left 19, just before the war kicked off, 1990, like 1989, towards the end of 89. Yes. And then, for two years, we've just been between, we keep coming back and then going back to Italy. Yes. We were, like, in between. Yes. And then when things got really bad, it was like, okay, we have to now go and settle somewhere. This is when things were really bad. Yes. So 92. Mm. And yeah, so we so went from, from, from privileged life to, to, to now. The, to, but do you know, but can, I, can I be honest? But let me ask you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but I, I'm sure most people mm. would ask this question. Puberty in Somali and mm. then puberty in Islam. Someone will say, you know, at least I'm in love. Right, right. Oh, no. Oh, absolutely. But remember, you told me Tokyo, you wouldn't know her country was poor. Yes. I didn't even know what Somali poverty yes, was like. Yes, yes. Like, I'm so, you can imagine how disconnected. There's a reason why the war happened. Mm. I want to really stress that. Mm. The reason the war happened, there was genuine divide. Between the half and the half. Like, literally, they didn't even, they didn't even cross paths by accident. It was that It was that, like, that divided. It was that divided, like you, you really didn't see it. But I remember my parents telling me a story how, so you know, I don't like most, I think most African parents do this. Even when you go to school, mm -hmm. you still have a tutor that comes into the house yes. teaching you. Yes. And it, my parents said it was that tutor that yes. said, um, if something happens, yes. you better get out very quickly because your house will be attacked. Yes. So my, my she didn't went into details. Yes. And as soon as the war kicked off, our, second, our house was the second house that was looted. What? It was looted. And then years later, mm. we, my mom bumped into this teacher in London somewhere. Mm. She managed to get out. Mm. And she said in the house that she lived in, mm. which was not a very like, well-to-do family, like she, mm. she was renting a room from them. Yes. She goes, I could hear the conversations. If, if there's something happens, we're going to attack that house. We're going to attack that house. So she goes, there was a whole plan yes. being put in place to attack, to attack certain people. Yes. So when I went to London, for me, that was the first time I experienced poverty. So London was my first poverty experience. It's, it's, it's crazy. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's my first poverty experience. And even to me, actually, I'm like, I've never had this side of story because mm. I, I know a couple of few people who have been privileged, but not so privileged, but I've not had their story. Like, how is yeah. it to transition? And how is it to rebuild? Because now, mm. if you're in that state now, your mind switches on and you're like, I need to rebuild that experience mm. that I but, moved but can out. But can I tell yeah. you? Yeah. That was the best thing that could have happened to my family. Mm. In, in, in the long run. I'll tell you why. Because the life we led in Mogadishu, mm. we were close family, but there was always, there was a gap. Mm. My father was busy just making money. He was never in the, like... He would go away for six weeks. Those days, you didn't have flights, regular flights. If yes. you left, you were away for at least three weeks, four weeks. Uh, so there wasn't... The, the, the war has made us so close. Yes. Because now we are... I mean, my dad could, didn't join us for two more years after that. Yes. They gen, my parents genuinely thought they were going to go back. Yes. My dad was going to wait around. Yes. And, you know, things would calm down. Uh -huh. and we'll, no, there was a three attempted assassinations on him. How, and how powerful was your dad? My dad, oh my God, his... his, his an amazing man. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a big part of who I am too, by the way. Like, he was, um, again, you know, my parents yeah. grew up in the most interesting time in Somalia. So they were both born into colonization. Uh -huh. So they knew, they knew freedom. Like, they really felt freedom. So they, they were born into colonization, then obviously they were free, yes, right? Yes, so they, were, yes. they saw both sides. So yeah. they really embraced their freedom. Yes. So I, they, they were lovers of art and Music. I mean, I was telling my one of my colleagues yesterday. I got my mom's hand luggage whenever she travelled. Mm. Was her records. Records. She was. She's a big music love. Like. Ah, music lover. What kind of music? Oh my god, she loves Somali bands. She loved uh, uh, disco funk. Oh. Uh, I was introduced to Motown very early on as, in my childhood. Nice. Even though we didn't speak English, but we knew all the Al Green songs and Diana Ross. We yes. knew all of them because yes. we had a it was a big music house. Yes. Yes. So I remember being. In that kind of um, mm. environment. But so I was saying, like, my dad, you know, there was a third assassination on him. Mm. And 
But him moving back to the UK, he, yeah, he finally yes. joining us. I think 94 is when we realized, okay, we're not going nowhere. We're going to be here. No <laughs> For a long, long time. For a very long time. Yeah. But what it gave us, and mm. we talk about this too now. Then by then, we have our little brother, who's my brother. By the time we came to the UK, he was four months. Mm. So he doesn't know that life. Mm. He only knows UK life. Mm. But what it gave us is a family unit that we still have to now. So in mm. a way, mm. it, was the, it was the best thing. Because me and my sister joke, that if the war never happened, would have been the Paris Hilton of Mogadishu. <laughs> and that doesn't sound like a good yeah. thing. <laughs> doesn't sound... Yeah. yeah I mean, so are you saying <laughs> privileged life throughout your life where you don't know poverty, you don't know stress, you we don't didn't know have, we, didn't, we didn't have real life experience. It was only... I think, I think the FGM experience was real life for me. That was mm. the most traumatic experience. And even as being privileged, you had to go through the FGM. Can you imagine? So this is, this is the thing, right? My, mm. my story, my work has always been, people have this assumption, especially the West has an mm. assumption, Oh, FGM only happens to people who are not educated. I'm like, no. My mother, her dad was a doctor. Yes. He took her to the hospital himself. FGM is about controlling women. It's controlling mm. the female body. It's controlling female sexuality. Mm. It's not about it, it's not about religion and culture. Yes. I hate when people put that, yes. wrap it around in that. It's not that. It's, we live in a society where we want to control women, full stop. Yes. And let's talk about FGM yeah. for a minute. Mm. But before that... Uh, you're also big on HIV AIDS. And I remember in the 90s, mm. and when I share my story and say why mm. that is so personal to me, it is, it, it's like wiped African, literally. Yeah. Like across. And I think even this is still happening in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. big. And one of the things that actually, most of the people who are affected by these are women. Absolutely. To start with. Because if someone gets sick, in African culture, a woman takes, takes care for mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. So, how 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 was that related to FGM and again again it, it, I, oh, everything I got involved in was by accident I never actually planned to do happened it. like it's like it's like the universe yes. guided me from undergoing FGM taking me out of my privileged life to the UK really shaped who I am today I don't yes. think I would be doing any of this if yes. that didn't happen to me yes um, so the HIV conversation came up during my work around violence against women, especially around FGM, because... Yes. They, so when they're cutting girls, they cut them in groups. Mm -hmm. And during the, those procedures, you can actually be infected with HIV. So a lot of girls... Were because you're just, sharing the, the Like the a blade, so the blood is yeah. just being like it's shared. All oh my mm -hmm. God, it's, it's, it's really bad. And, and, and not just that, a lot of the girls who have undergone FGM have experienced so there was a wave of and it's still happening somewhere yes where men felt um if i if i have sex with a with a virgin yes the, I, my hiv will disappear so a lot of girls what? were raped so what? imagine they're closed their genitalia is totally closed now they've been raped now they've been diagnosed yeah. with hiv and guess what happens in the community she gets ostracized she's the one kicked out called people say she's a witch and she's only 11 like you can imagine, so when I when I my when I say my work around, it's not just the girl child. My work has been around the African girl child. Yeah. So if you look at uh, the statistics of um, WHO, the World Health Organization, clearly yes. states yes. the most vulnerable human being in the world yes. is the girl African child. She's the one who's left behind. No one ever remembers. Every time something goes down in the world, she's the last one we think of. Because she's she's not even the fact that she's born female, uh -huh. the fact that she's born black, mm -hmm. and she's now in Africa. Yes, in a, in a, in a part of part of the world we think is the developed. Yes, yeah. So it's it's um, so you can imagine. So FGM and HIV has been attacking those two groups the most. Hence, why now we don't even talk about HIV anymore. So, so you could me, not address FGM without addressing HIV and AIDS. Not just and not just that. When you're addressing FGM, you have to address obviously. HIV and AIDS, you have to address inequality, mm. you have to address uh, uh, all forms of gender-based violence, you have to address economical mm. abuse, because mm. FGM happens, so a parent, especially in Kenya, you guys have a practice where the girl gets cut, mm -hmm. mutilated, next day, or a few days after she's married off, and I'm using air quotes here, I don't believe a child get, can be married forgive off, my I, hate, I hate forgive I Forgive my word. ignorance. Yeah. Forgive my ignorance, because... I have the information I have about FGM mm. and there's the facts about FGM. Mm. So number one, I know some of the communities that I've read and mm. investigated that they do FGM mm -hmm. specifically is to control a woman. Mm. 
is to control the female body and, and her exactly. sexuality. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that if a guy goes to also or to look for 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 food and money mm. and whatever, mm. she cannot go outside the marriage. Yep. And I understand when you say someone is cut and then they are married off. Yep. It, it's really it's, it's like very a maturity with, transition. And it's, and it's to do with economics. Yes. The parents cannot afford to keep her in the house anymore. So it's a commodity. They turn yeah. out to be a commodity. Well, she, if she leaves, then mm. less money for the family to spend. Ah. It's less less mouth to feed. Ah. But it's the girl who gets sacrificed in the family. Yes. So it's the moment she's eight, nine years old, mm. she's going to be cut, being given away to a man who's 45. Mm. And that leads to other forms of abuse. Mm. And even to a lot of physical abuse in terms of if she gets pregnant, mm. her body can no longer, her body can even carry a baby. Yes. So they, ha- they end up having something called fistula. Yes. Fistula is when the yes. vagina wall breaks. Really bad. It's yeah. bad. Yeah. It's so common, but we don't talk about it. Do you know how many women are affected by fistula? Just in this country yes, Somalia yes. has like special houses yes for, for, for girls with fistula but no one talks about it. and it's a, such a simple operation to it's fix a stigma by itself the stigma but it's such an operational uh, operation to fix this mm. but no one funds it no one's funded it it's, it's crazy to me it's literally she just needs a small operation in a clinic you don't even have to go to a big hospital it can yes. be done in a small clinical room oh wow okay it's, you just needs to suture that vagina wall again And, and she'll be fine. Her whole life, okay. like it, it makes a massive change to her whole life. But we don't even our governments are not even thinking of this. They focus on something else. We put so much effort towards COVID. Mm, and a lot of billions in dollars. Billions to COVID. Well, most of that virus. was stolen, but uh, it's it's okay. <laughs> this is you saying this. <laughs> That's another discussion. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, but do you see how we are conditioned, right? So if you look at our minds, mm. look at how we've been conditioned. Like we've been conditioned. To fo- put so much focus on a virus, we can actually we couldn't even see. We were mm. fighting something we could not mm. see. Who even knows this, this whole thing? I'm, I'm not. Is I it don't, real? I don't or give not? It to, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, listen, I don't want. I don't want to trigger people who. Where is that question? It's open. Everyone is asking. But for me, whether it was real or not, for me, it's we need to really ask ourselves: mm. Why did we focus so much on that? Where three million girls in Africa at risk every three million girls are cut every year in Africa. Mm. That we're not shutting down streets, locking people down for it. Mm. Asking why is that? Actually, How can we address it? Why are we not addressing this? And that the cutting leads to so many problems, mm. like fistula. Mm. Like this is it really affects her whole life unless yes. that's fixed. Yes, it, it affects her whole life. There's no way the stigma. And then she's again ostracized, even not adults poor in that situation. Yes, where she's mutilated, then married off. I don't like to say that. I don't like the word marriage, by the way. I like to clarify this. I'm, I'm using air quotes. Yes. I hate. I hate. Um, one of the things I'm challenging in the space that I work in yes. is language. Yes. Language has such an impact, right? The way you frame something has yes. an impact on how you deal with it. Yes. So when we're saying child marriage, mm. we're saying we know it's wrong, <laughs> but you brush it's the word marriage yeah. into it because you know marriage yeah. is something that two adults consent to yes like it's something two adults consent so these yeah. girls did not consent and their in, children their children in it. the west yeah they would never use the word child marriage it's mm-hmm. called pedophiles if an adult man and it's a serious crime it's a serious crime so why can't we give our girls the same justice that that's what i'm saying Le- when you're saying Leila's fighting for african girls yes that's what i'm fighting for yes because we're not giving our girls that look like us that looks like my daughter, our mm. daughters, mm. are never given the same justice. Mm. Just by language. We're not even calling it for what it is. Mm. If a girl in, 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 Lon- in London, white girl, blonde hair, blue eyed, mm. was given to a 45-year-old man, he would be in prison. He would be beaten up in prison. He, he'd be lucky if he's alive. Mm. Because it's, that's zero tolerance. Yes. But then why us Africans? This is how Africans, our minds have been conditioned. Yes. Because, you know, we experienced abuse, abuse going back to slavery. Yes. Because that was so bad. Yes. This is not even a big deal anymore. And that's the frame of mind we need to start shifting. So are you saying we are, we are, we are releasing our pain that we have experienced for a long time through, through slavery? We normalized it. Colonization. We, we normalized that pain. It's okay. We normalized that pain. We, no, we, we, what, is, what we started doing, we started putting levels. It's like, ah, this is not the worst one. Mm. Why is pain ever okay? Pain should never be okay. It's, oh my God, especially when we're inflicting it on our girls. Even our boys, like that's a whole different conversation. Like this, even with when we see toxic men or toxic women, mm. it means we've abused them as children. Mm. So there's no ever one thing that that I, I wish we can do in this continent 
it's really have a healthy conversation about children how we treat children mm. because that's what's creating these toxic people mm. you know like you, you have to go back a little bit mm. and we look at like looking at our education system yes how that impacts yes. the information we give yes so for me what africa needs it needs to re recharge our brain and reset and we need to reset because it's not okay mm. that a 9 year old is given away to a 45 year old man or 60 year old man mm. and and we brush it with the idea of culture and marriage mm. that's not acceptable on the other side of the world yes rightly so yes why is it okay for us that's the challenge yes. and i'm challenging that to all of your listeners yes too. yes yes why do we think that's okay ask mm. yourself mm. why is it okay when it comes to our children mm. somehow we just it's okay it's okay for us to be poor it's okay for us not to look after our children mm. it's okay for us to abuse our our girls yes but in the other side of the world that's not acceptable there are laws and policies that protect you but here we normalize it even we don't acknowledge it yes you know what i mean